Entwined is a podcast about how so much of the world around us is wound or twisted together. This podcast strives to bear unexposed or indiscernible connections using historical and anecdotal sources. I am P.S. McKay, and along with Elliot Gladstone, this is Entwined. Lake Tahoe is a remote resort that boasts about being 25 miles long and up to 1,600 feet deep. There is so much water that theoretically, if you drained it into the area of California, the entire state would be covered in two inches of water. Too bad that wouldn't do anything to help with the drought crisis. Over the decades, it has become a place for families and vacationers to flock to in the summers where water skiing and swimming is an ideal. During the winter, the area is repurposed for snowmobiles and skiing down the Sierra mountainsides that rim the entirety of the lake, 6,000 feet in altitude. Sharing a border between California and Nevada, there are of course casinos that straddle the border, open 24 hours for those hungry to take their chance at potential winnings. It's neat. The largest of the casinos in South Lake actually are connected underground, allowing people to go from one building to another without having to go outside. While the casinos don't bring the crowds they once used to, there are still nights where it is standing room only during special celebrity golf tournaments and such. Harvey Gross was the man who pioneered the bringing of the gaming industry. He made his casino Harvey's into a resort experience along the sparkling blue waters of Tahoe. It was an event to be there. And on August 27, 1980, Harvey stood on the street watching his beloved casino. There was a large crowd gathered, raucously waiting, taking bets, and overall having a great time. But not Harvey. He was waiting. He was filled with anxiety and fear. Like many of whom he made money off of, he was taking a chance. For you see, there was a bomb in his casino, and no one knew how to defuse it. I'm not sure if you are a particular fan of current events. I am, especially of the geopolitical kind. For whatever is currently happening will eventually become history, and only when we distance ourselves from when the event actually happened can we best learn from it. Which is why I find the situation in Crimea so fascinating. If you're not aware, allow me to give a quick recap. In the winter of 2014, the president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, passed a referendum expanding economic ties with Russia. The public, particularly in western Ukraine where the capital is, did not accept this. The public was more interested in expanding west and perhaps joining the EU at some point in the future, opening up new realms of economic expansion. If you have Netflix, I recommend you watch the documentary Winter on Fire. It details the events of the first few days after this resolution. Eventually, after days of protests and clashes, Yanukovych fled to Russia. The young people of the Ukraine were not interested in the old Eastern ideals. They wanted to grow up in a Western country and the following days showed the widespread corruption that Yanukovych yielded. From embezzling millions to using taxpayer funds to build a huge compound complete with a life-size wooden ship docked in a lake on his property, a veritable playground for him while the rest of the country dealt with a severe recession. Well, long story short, Russia did not like this. They spent considerable amounts of money trying to maintain a complicit and cooperative government in Ukraine, and they were not going to just let the country slip to the West. You see, this falls in line with what Russia has always intended, protecting the motherland. The country was deeply scarred by the invasions of Napoleon and the Germans in both world wars. These invasions cost millions of Russian lives, and their doctrine in the latter half of the 20th century was to make a buffer zone of countries within its sphere of influence. Countries that would listen to Russia and could be used as cannon fodder in the event of a Western invasion. Tactically, it makes sense. It's heartless, but 
tell that to the millions of civilians and soldiers who died during those previous conflicts. My point here is that Russia in 2014 felt that it was losing that cushion of defense, and in retaliation, they invaded Crimea, an isolated block of land in the Black Sea connected by an isthmus to the rest of Ukraine. Russia had, quote-unquote, gifted the land to Ukraine back in 1954, and I know I am simplifying the history of a very complex region, and I apologize for that. What makes this unusual is that we haven't seen a democratic country invade another democratic country in over 70 years. It's just not done nowadays. The people who live in those democratic countries don't feel there is a particular need to do so, especially since they share the ideology of a democracy. Instead of attacking a vicious dictator or warlord, you're attacking people much like yourself in a country structurally similar. The annexation of Crimea is still playing out, and we are in a time of great change. While we know that we are in that change, we have no idea in which direction that will lead us. Crimea is but that starting point, and I am not meaning to be alarmist because I don't think we're heading in this direction, but the last time an annexation like this happened, a world war was started. Janos Burgess was born in Hungary in 1922. His family would later be given large swaths of land by the Germans after its annexation. However, Janos, in return, was forced to enter the ensuing war for fear that the government would turn on the family if he failed to serve. He became a pilot for the Royal Hungarian Air Force, and was part of the forces that repelled the Russians during the waning years of the war. He ended up being captured and sent to a gulag. There he spent eight years with prisoners of war in grueling, laborious conditions alongside, but not integrated, with the Russian enemies of state. In fact, while there is little distinction between the conditions of the gulags and where the POWs were held, I'm pretty sure the enemies of state were treated far worse than the POWs. Stalin hated the Axis soldiers, but he hated insurrectionists even more. It wasn't until 1954, during a mass repatriation program, he was sent home to settle in Hungary. In 1957, he emigrated to the U.S. with his wife, where he changed his name from Janos to the more Anglican John. They settled in the Fresno area of California and began the process of managing their American dream. John started a successful landscaping business, setting contracts with different municipalities and golf courses around the state. He became a millionaire and, following his passion for food, purchased his first restaurant. Everything he touched with hard work and determination, John was able to make a success. On the outside, everything appeared to be on the up for John. Successful businesses burgeoning, a growing family, but those years in the gulag led to a very different story behind closed doors. We know now that erratic behavior from former soldiers can be attributed to PTSD, but back then, it was just accepted that sometimes a war changed you, and you had to get over it. John was a monster to his family. He would routinely whip his wife and sons with his belts or wires whenever he was upset over the slightest thing. Particularly terrible were stories of him scattering gravel on the kitchen floor and forcing his boys to kneel whenever they neglected in their selective chores. His wife, Elizabeth, whom he had brought to the U.S. from Hungary, filed for divorce in 1973. She disappeared in 1975, only to have her body found after three days in a field by her house. It was ruled a suicide due to her system containing large amounts of alcohol and Valium. But John had no remorse for her, as he took her cremated remains and dumped them in the yard. His sons watching on. To top it off, the mid-1970s saw John go into a downward spiral. He had always had a penchant for gambling, but now his losses were beginning to add up. His restaurant mysteriously burned down, and he collected $300,000 from the insurance company 
only to lose it all to the blackjack tables, many of which Harvey Gross owned in his resort in Tahoe. John was sanctioned by the IRS for back taxes, and he also began to bounce checks he was writing to Harvey's casino. John was at a point where something desperate had to be done. He calculated that over the years he lost about $600,000. Rather than seek help for his gambling problem, he externalized and felt he needed to teach Harvey's a lesson, and perhaps recover his fortune in the process. It was 6.30 in the morning on Tuesday, August 26, 1980. Bob Vinson was just coming off his shift as night manager when he came across a large metal box that was sitting in a corner near the phone room. It had been placed on four wooden platforms under its legs and was deeply impressed into the carpet, so whatever inside was pretty heavy. On top of it was a smaller box with 28 toggle switches, all unmarked, only one of which was toggled up. There was also a letter addressed to Harvey's management on top of the contraption. It read, not to move or tilt the bomb. The slightest movement would set it off. Any diffusing techniques, such as flooding or gassing the box, would only set off another trigger. Any disassemblement would register on the floor plate and also set it off. The hotel's 600 guests and employees were quickly evacuated. The FBI was called in to examine the device. X-rays showed there was no dynamite or even TNT in it, but large cylinders of liquid. The letter proceeded to advise that the device was to go off within 24 hours unless demands were met. Three million dollars was to be paid at a certain site. The bills had to be clean and unmarked if their demands were not followed specifically. Instructions on how to disarm the device would not be provided. The FBI was concerned. They couldn't tell if there was a timer in the device through the x-rays, and since no one was present when the bomb was planted, they had no way to tell when the exact moment of detonation would happen. They could see that all the toggle switches were in fact connected to wires that ran throughout the device. It was possible that a certain combination could be hit on those switches to disarm the device, but they didn't have enough time. Harvey Gross was understandably distressed about the situation. His precious casino that he had built from the humble beginnings of just three slot machines was in danger. And yet, despite his fears, he was livid at the idea of being extorted. He refused to give the perpetrator any sort of money. Cooperation with the ransomer was key if there was any hope in saving the casino. So bags were filled with stacks of money-colored paper topped with real bills. The plan was to follow the drop instructions and hope the ransomer would leave the deactivation instructions. Unfortunately, it was botched. The instructions were ambiguous, and the helicopter pilot landed with the bags in the small Tahoe airport and waited at a payphone. Shortly after midnight, it rang, and a voice said that there were instructions beneath the table in front of him. Yet there was no table, and the caller had hung up before the pilot could say so. He ran desperately, looking under every hard surface for anything that could have had it, and he did eventually come across an envelope with the word pilot on it. It instructed him to a location a few miles from the airport and to hover under 500 feet and wait for the strobe light. At that point, the bags were to be dropped and the pilot was to fly back. He flew to what the position was supposed to be, but no strobe light was seen. He waited for a long time until his fuel was almost empty. Frustrated, he had to abandon the area for fear of crashing and headed to refuel. Only then did the pilot realize he misunderstood the directions and was miles off the intended target. The drop period had come and gone. Harvey's casino's fate was sealed. At this point, the question became, how can the FBI contain the blast? They didn't know when it was to blow. They didn't have the luxury of time trying to defuse it through trial and error on the toggles. One person suggested putting together an ancillary explosion that would sever the main nerves of the bomb, preventing the main explosives from detonating. Harvey agreed, reluctantly, considering that it was the lesser of all the bad choices. Clearing the area, the closest civilians were about one mile from ground zero. 
Numerous sheriff's cars patrolled Highway 50 up and down, advising that there was a potential explosive event to take place. Finally, one of the texts said, Fire in the hole. Harvey would not comment on the episode when it transpired, but it was said that there were tears in his eyes as the bomb went off. It was later determined that nitroglycerin was the explosive substance, and because it was nitroglycerin, the explosion could not be contained. If you look on YouTube, you can see when the actual moment happened. I remember seeing a sheriff's squad car doing a quick and reckless three-point turn as it sped away from the casino down Highway 50 as the walls on the lower level gave way. It was 34 hours after the discovery of the bomb. Luckily, given the advanced warning, no one was harmed, unless they may have been making bets on when that bomb was supposed to explode. The overall structure of the casino remained sound, and none of the visitors' locations were damaged. As far as Harvey was concerned, he could open up the next day with minimal loss. John Burgess, after a night of waiting in the drop location, covered in bugs with a strobe light that went unused, heard of the incident while driving with his son on the radio. John deflated at the news. His tamper-proof device, while technically was not tampered with, failed to appreciate to his true plan. In the end, it was over a year before the FBI was able to find John Burge and confirm that he was the bomber. It came from an unidentified caller who dated one of John's sons overhearing the overall extortion plot. Upon questioning, John's sons eventually gave their side of the story, placing John as the mastermind of the operation and the technical genius who created the bomb. John Burgess Sr. died of liver cancer in Southern Nevada Correctional Center in 1996 at the age of 74. Harvey's Casino is still in operation to this day in Tahoe, although now it is owned by a conglomeration. Upon reviewing the specs of the bomb that sat there in the casino taunting the FBI's best minds, it was finally determined that the bomb could not have been defused. It was the most sophisticated homemade improvisational explosive device ever made. The agency was able to make a replica of it, demonstrating the seven different activators that would have gone off if the bomb was tampered with by flooding, wire cutting, tipping, pressure, electrocution, and playing with the toggle switches. That bomb, known currently as the device, is used to this day at FBI headquarters to teach new recruits in the art of explosive devices. It was the annexation of Hungary that started this whole process. Without it, John Burgess would not have lived the life he did, and the FBI would not have his genius to learn from and to try to avoid in the future. The question is now, in this current time of change, with the annexation of Crimea, the instability in the Middle East, what other long-term issues do we have to contend with? Remember, everything is entwined. Be it the largest world war to the lowliest landscaper of Fresno, California, history is our greatest guide to our current affairs. Thank you for listening. Entwined is a podcast that releases every other week and is written, recorded, and produced by P.S. McKay and Elliot Gladstone. This episode was written by P.S. McKay. Please tune in next time to see what Elliot Gladstone has in store for us. For more information about the show and the authors, please check out entwinedpodcast.com or visit our Twitter page at entwinedpodcast.com.